podcast land. Welcome to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. And before I introduce my special guest, Andrew Cohen, I got to do a little house, house cleaning here. So um, first of all, we're at the Yellow Jacket Media Studios in bustling Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. The show is brought to you by E4 Strength, my company, e4strength.com. E-Force is the most revolutionary strength conditioning piece of equipment on the market today. If you're into that kind of stuff, if you understand how the body works and how muscles develop, your body can hold and lower more weight than it can lift. So your body, imagine lowering somebody by a rope down a cliff, it'd be a lot easier to do that than to pull them back up. So your body is stronger holding and lowering weight. So our device allows you to hold and lower more weight than you can lift. And then the device activates and allows you to lift that weight back up. So it allows you to increase your strength exponentially more than traditional strength condi- and conditioning equipment. So if you want to learn more about that, go to e4strength.com. All right, my man, Andrew Cowan. How are you, brother? I'm doing great. Chilling out here. Yeah. Ready to have a good time, talk some football. That's, that's the key, man. So for everybody that doesn't know, Andrew's a good buddy of mine. We've been friends for uh, seven, eight years now. Um, Andrew owns a company called Get Recruited Consulting. It's a um, football consulting business where he helps high school kids get college scholarships, but he also does it now in, in the lacrosse world. And we're going to talk a lot about how, uh, how he does that and, and how um, valuable a resource he is and why. Um, he's also a good buddy. He's someone that I admire, and uh, I, I look forward to spending the next hour having a chat with you, bud. Sounds awesome. I'm pretty excited myself. Thanks All right, for having me on. So I, uh, and you're going to have to talk into the mic. That's the key. That's, that's half the battle of being on a show. <laughs> um, I ask every one of my, my guests the same question. And I'm going to ask you, and I know you're not prepared for this because I didn't even give you a, a tee up for this, but the question is, who is Andrew Cohen? All right. That's, that's kind of put me on the spot. Yeah, I like see? it. Okay. Andrew Cohen is a 48-year-old man that is very fortunate to have two great boys. I got a, I got Seth. Seth's a 16 year old. He goes to high school at Westchester East. He's a lacrosse athlete and a great kid. And my 12 year old is Kyle. And they're, your, they're just really great kids. And they're, they really are my life. Um, I'm a hard worker. I try to set an example for my, for my boys and everything I've done in life, whether it was a college football coach for 22 years or even growing up as a high school and college football player, it was always, you know, working my hardest to get the most out of my talents. So I'd say I'm definitely an overachiever. And uh, that's something that I try to lead by example for my, for my two boys. And they definitely do that. They are great students, great kids, and, and pretty good athletes because they work hard at it. So that Andrew Cohen is a hardworking, honest, loyal, good person that cares about people. And I would agree 100% in all <laughs> that. Because it's the, the reason why I asked that question um, is because what I may think of you may be different than what you think of yourself. So I always ask my guests, who are they? Because their own interpretation is the one that is the one that uh, I'm interested in because I, my own preconceived notion of who you are, or who any other guest was um, really is irrelevant to the, the interview. So let's talk about overachieving. Let's talk about hard work. Cause I know, you know, you, we know each other's family stories and, and, you know, my daughter is, is a, is a very talented swimmer in college. And I tell people all the time that I didn't give her the DNA of an amazing athlete. She's not, she's not just naturally a great swimmer. She had to overachieve in order to achieve the things that she got. You know, I told her when she was in high school, I said, you get four years of high school. And if you're lucky, four years of college to, to do the sport that you love, um, you have a choice. You can commit to giving everything you've got during those eight years, or you can be happy with whatever you achieve with whatever talent and effort you provide. And anywhere in between there could be your success meter, right? So what was, you, what was it about you? I mean, you're not giftedly tall <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not giftedly fast and I can't jump, but I played basketball and I made the most of what I had. What made you, um, a fall in love with, with football and B, um, when did you decide that hard work was going to be the, the formula to getting you to where you believe you could go? Okay. So I, I started playing football. I was, I was six years old. My dad was a high school and middle school coach 
all growing up. And I have two older brothers. Um, I have a brother, Stu is the oldest. He's what, uh, 53, 54, sorry. And the other one's uh, 51, that's Dave. My brother Dave is also a college football coach. He coaches at Wake Forest University. But I always looked up to my brothers. They were great role models. Um, so, so realistically, I think, you know, seeing them got me into it. And then when I started playing, it was just something I, I wouldn't even say it was my best sport, but it was something that I just fell in love with. And by the time I got into probably ninth grade, I was pretty obsessed with my training, probably training too much and my reading and just always football, football, football. And, and I think part of that's my family. And then part of it's just something I fell in love with. Um, I think a lot of successful college football coaches are guys that a lot of times weren't great players because I was not a great player. I was a running back and a linebacker in high school and college. I was a linebacker at, at Marist College. Uh, at the time, we were Division three, and I had an okay career. I started a little bit, but, um, but I'm proud that I got to play and that I outworked other guys that were definitely better than me. I am vertically challenged at 5'7", <laughs> um, probably at the time about 200 pounds, but I played linebacker, and, and I'm proud of that. And uh, it's something I instill in my, in my family as well. So – one of the things that stood out, yeah, you know, I agree that I've heard that that comparison that great athletes don't always make great coaches. Did you, and you mentioned that you were obsessed with football and obsessed with your training and obsessed with reading and learning about football. Did, did you find that your, in, your IQ, your football IQ was higher than your football ability? Did you, did, were you a student of the game? Hmm. That's a good question. I think that in a high school level, it was just because it meant more to me. My football IQ definitely was higher than other kids. So I, I would say yes, even even in college, it was because I didn't just, you know, a coach would tell you something and a lot of kids just memorized it. And I tried to understand when the coach told me what that meant for everyone surrounding me, which I thought would allow me to the better understanding would allow me to play better, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. No one's no one where everybody's roles and responsibilities were I'm filling in in this certain angle because I have help on the outside or the inside whatever it might be without getting too technical and I think that understanding made me play a little faster and and a little better you know yeah and some guys just want to go out and play and that's fine but they might be better if they went out and played a little smarter and that's where you know I with my business with the max out strength studio business and, and with eForce and working with athletes I I see a lot of kids that are um, the overachievers that, that want their success more than the kids that maybe were born naturally with a talent. So they're in the gym more frequently and they're just working their ass off trying to, to improve their, their potential for, for success. And then you have the kids that are just naturally gifted athletes. And it's not that they don't work hard, but they don't have to work as hard to be gifted. And the ones that make it to Division One and then go on to play professional are the ones that I would say more often than not also put in the hard work. Um, there are a few exceptions to that rule. Um, and, and I don't begrudge anybody for working with what they got. And if God gave them a ton, God bless them. But having that ability to um, be a student of the game when you're not necessarily the fastest or the strongest or the biggest probably allowed you to have um, a greater confidence level in understanding what, you know, understanding what a lot of times kids go out and when their coach tells them to go do something, they just go do it because that, that's what the coach said. They don't really understand why they're doing it, the purpose behind it or what the, the scheme is. If you're a defensive player, did you find that you found comfort in knowing what the coach wanted you to do and why, or did you just, know your responsibility because you knew the left and the right of you were, were covered. I, I think part of that was determined by who the actual coach was. Some coaches were good at, they were a good coach is a good teacher. So they were able to not just say you're going right or you're going left um, or you're going into this gap or that gap. They would explain how to get there, why you're getting there. And you're going to do this to a blocker for, because your help is either inside or outside. And then you had other coaches that just would say your responsibility and that would really be it. So I felt like when someone was 
willing to be a teacher and said, hey, I, I got to make sure that Andrew Cohen knows what he's doing and why he's doing it, that made me myself a better player. There are guys that are good enough that just go and they can just make plays because they're phenomenal athletes. But those guys are rare, you know, so. So your coaches, let's talk about them because I think, you know, we don't spend enough time in our adult life reflecting and, and giving thanks to those that helped us get to where we are, right? I'm sure you didn't get into college coaching and start your, your get recruited business simply out of your own effort. There was other people that, that helped mold you and create this fire inside of you and this want to, to be a great coach. Where did that start? Which coach, if you could go back in time, which coach was the one that you think started that, that coaching gene, that, that fire in you? My brother, Dave Cohen, who's now at Wake Forest, was always, I mean, I have good parents at home, good father, good mother, but my brother was always like my parent and was always something, somebody that I looked up to very strongly. And being that, it's probably why I got into coaching my junior year in college. I, I was unfortunately had two knee surgeries and I got to, to, co to uh, be somewhat of an assistant and help out at Marist College. That was a great experience. But my brother motivated because he was already coaching and it was something I saw him having a lot of success with, a lot of enjoyment, and it's someone that I looked up to. So that's, that's how I really got into it. I had a lot of good people uh, that I played for as a coach. Like it, in my high school, I think I had, I had good people. I mean, Coach Hoagland was my coach from the – I played varsity in 10th grade, and then we joined two schools together, and we had Coach Matera. They're good guys that I, I think I had a very good relationship with. I, I wouldn't say they, they – I didn't need much motivation, for one. Two, I don't think that was their – I don't think that was their strengths. Um, I then went and I played at Marist College, and I played for Coach uh, – a guy named uh, Rick Pardee, um, who was a great guy. He was a motivator, and I still somewhat stay in contact with him. And then after him, funny or not, um, was Jim Parody. So that is the guy that replaced him, kind of funny. He's still the head coach there, and I still have a relationship with him, and he's a, a great guy, runs a great program, and, and I enjoy that. But I never had that – I wouldn't say I ever had that real, like, role model as a coach. Like my, a mentor my, coach. A mentor right. coach. I, I, they were good people. They, they held me accountable. But it's definitely my brother who's very good at what he does, but he's also a good person. And I – growing up, I idolized him. He was a very good football player, and he's still a very good coach and a good family man. So he was a good, uh, a good person for me to look up to and follow. I, it's not everybody has the luxury of having a, a – an older brother who um, not only is, is an older brother, but also serves as a mentor and an, in the profession you end up taking the role model and the person you follow and, and emulate. Um, so I think that's a, a rarity in your case. So let's talk about um, how did you get your first college football coaching job? Cause it's, you know, everybody's got their story on, on how they, they got their first break in, in the business and, you know, it's coaching whatever sport, at the collegiate level um, is tough. And then uh, from what I've heard, a lot of it is relationship building from there on. You know, I know strength coaches that get their first gig as a strength coach and the, the assistant coach ends up getting a head coaching job and brings along the strength coach from his first place to be his strength coach. It's sort of that familiarity. Is that kind of how your break happened or was it completely different? No, it, it, it definitely is. Um, and that, that is how it works. It's about contacts. It's about relationships. But my funny story, again, it involves my, my brother. So my first coaching job was at SUNY Stony Brook in Long Island, Stony Brook University. We were Division Three at the time. They're now a very, very good 1AA program. But that's where I, I got a job as a uh, graduate assistant. I coached my first year there. I coached the uh, defensive tackles. And then I was fortunate they allowed me to coach the entire defensive line. But um, I was a senior in college. I decided after helping out as a, as a junior with the team, I played my senior year. And I decided after talking to my brother and my family, I wanted to be a coach. So my brother really steered me in terms of I remember writing a ton of cover letters to places that he knew they had openings, graduate assistance type of jobs, and that he had a contact that can get me in. So Stony Brook's in Long Island. I grew up in Long Island. My brother knew some of the coaches, Sam Kornhauser and Dave Caldero, who were two. They were great mentors. I really should have brought them up. They're two of the best people I've ever met, and they just did everything the right way. Great work ethic, great human beings. Kids loved them. They're just great, great guys. But um, my brother knew those guys and just got me in the loop to at least get to get an interview. And then I was fortunate enough, 
to, uh, that was my first coaching job. And I went into it saying, hey, if I can get a master's degree out of it, which I did, and see if I like it. And very quickly, I knew I liked it. And that's, that's what became my career. I did not go into it saying I'm 100% sure I want to be a coach. But I said, hey, if I can get a degree, another degree, a master's degree out of it. Um, I might as well go for it. And I had a great experience. And that's why years later, I came back as the defensive coordinator at uh, Stony Brook University. But then they were Division One AA. So it was a little different level of football, but it was a lot of fun. So, so again, we're, the theme is your brother, which is, yeah, you know, I love, you know, obviously, you know, the story about me and my brother and, and there's, there's something magical about brothers or siblings for that matter that, um, that take care of each other. You know, that's not always the case. There's not always, you know, I know a lot of people that aren't super close with their sibling and I, and I, I don't publicly say it, but I, I often wonder why, like, what is it? Why wouldn't you want to be like close with your sibling? Like you grew up with them. <laughs> like granted, there's, there's probably drama in every family and there's things that happen. But um, I think overall the, the goal should be that you want to have a strong relationship with your siblings. And I, I love the fact that your brother um, helped to open the door for you into a profession that not only he loved, but, but one that you found to love. Yeah. I mean, um, it, and it wasn't just my first job. There were jobs after that, that he helped out. And th the good of it is I have someone that's always in my corner. He's kind of hard on me at times. He's like a parent. So sometimes that could be annoying, but in the long run, I know he's got my back. And, you know, later on, he, you know, he helped me make more contacts, which got me better jobs. And, you know, I had to get the job, but it, sometimes it's just getting your foot in the door. So I'm definitely fortunate that I have a brother that cares enough and he's still, always checking up. I mean, I'm 48 years old. He's still checking up on me like I'm a little kid, but I know it's for all good reasons. So. One of the, I think, I don't think people quite understand um, how you have to go through the, the grunt stages of coaching or, or any level of in sports that it's not like you get your first job and you're making a million dollars, right? It's not, that's not how it looks. And you know, I, I, where I'm a cop at in Collegeville is Ursinus College, and, and it's amazing to see the, the tree of, of athletes and coaches that have come from Ursinus. And, and it's a D3 school. It's not, you know, it costs a shit ton to go there, but, you know, I, I can't imagine the coaches are making bank um, in, in coaching world level. But guys that, you know, you start at the, the smaller schools and, and you make your relationships and you work your way up, and, and if you stick with it long enough and you're good at your profession, you're going to get more opportunities. I just think it's amazing how, you know, the head coach at University of Florida played tight end at Ursinus College. And, you know, he, he got his first job coaching through an Ursinus College uh, connection that, you know, the, the relationship component of coaching, you know, strength coaches, they got to do the graduate assistant thing and they're working 60, 70 hours a week for, you know, 10 bucks an hour essentially. And, you got to do that for a long time. And, and it's not until you hit the, the, the highest level of, of college coaching that does the strength coach make significant money and, and you got to pay your dues. Did you have to go through the paying your dues process? I did. If it's okay, I can even just go through my, my coaching yeah. stints and, and that process. So my first year and a half of coaching, I was at Stony Brook. I'll be very specific with numbers. They paid me $4,400 a year. Wow. Um, they paid for half my master's. I forgot. It wasn't all. It was like half or a little bit more. But, a, you know, a good opportunity at a New York State school for a New York guy. Um, so then after that year and a half, I got my master's. And then I went on to, to Bucknell University in Pennsylvania, a FCS slash I still call it one double A school. I actually took a job there in March. And I remember I, I went on, I, I loaded up my car. And I said, I'm either going to take this job at Colgate and I, or if I get offered it or at Bucknell. Going in, I thought I was going to like Colgate better and ended up I took the job at Bucknell. Um, so I took the job at Bucknell. It was um, from March till September, no pay. Okay. But it was, they gave me a place to stay. I stayed with the head coach, which was great because I developed a, a great relationship with him and he's definitely the mentor for coaching, not for playing, for coaching. Tom Gad, who unfortunately passed away. Um, and from there, um, they paid for like one meal a day or something like that. You know, and that's what I got. So I didn't complain. I just wanted to, and I knew 
that I was going to make $10,000 my first year starting in September. That's all I was going to get paid. Cost of living in central P Pennsylvania is obviously very inexpensive, but still $10,000. And so I, I was fortunate that I kept bumping up. My role really didn't change much, but then if, I think it was, it took me three years for me to get full time. And I don't remember what it was to pay. It was probably like 30,000 or something like that. I wasn't exactly uh, rich at that point. And then I left there. I made a little more money, but more so I took the job at Stony Brook to be where I'm, I'm from to also be a higher role. I was a defensive coordinator. Um, I was a defensive coordinator. I think I was making like 45. I'm, there's no shame. I don't care. That's right. what I was making, you know. Uh, but I had a good experience, a great experience. Coach Kornhauser, the head coach, was there for a very long time. Great, great guy. Let me run the defense. We developed a really good team. And, and maybe just maybe as good a group of kids as I've, I've ever been around. They were just very appreciative, and they became part of my family. You know, have them over my house and all that. Um, I left there strategically because – they hired a new athletic director and I knew it would probably be hard to keep my job. And so a year later, I, I mean, that, that time I did go to Fordham university, another FCS school to coach the defensive line for two years. And the, the head coach, coach Kornhauser left or did they let him go? I don't know exactly, but I, I would have been out of job. So that's some, you know, that's the hard part of coaching. You have to kind of, it's like playing pool. You got to plan ahead your next steps. So with that being said, I went to Fordham, was there two years, coached some really good players. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to go there to Columbia, which was Ivy League, and coached a defensive line. Their head coach, Norris Wilson, worked with me at, at Bucknell. So I didn't even have to interview or anything like that. So that was kind of neat. Working in the Ivy League and the kind of kids and the people you're working with there was a, a great experience. But uh, after being there a year and a half, I got offered the defensive coordinator job at at Bucknell. And that was something I felt like, you know, I met my wife there and that was a great experience. And it's one double a football Patriot league, really good level of football. And to be a coordinator at that level was something I, and make a few more bucks in an area that the cost of living was low. So, so that was a good experience. I was there for three and a half years and then our head coach left. So unfortunately, you know, I was the acting head coach. I didn't get the job. And uh, so I was, unemployed for a year I, I uh, volunteered had a great experience at at Lycoming College a division three school in Williamsport uh coach Weiser was a defensive coordinator and really because I was a, I'm sure I was a pain in the neck there's no question and probably thought I knew more than I did and then coach Clark the head coach they were just really good mentors as well and really just changed my my view so that's when I changed my view of going back to division three so I went and then after that, I got a real job at, at Bowdoin College in Maine, Division Three. Great experience, a lot of success. And then from there, I got offered a head coaching job at Hamilton College. And uh, that's a small, really, really strong academic Division Three school outside of Syracuse. And I was there two seasons and just realized that coaching was just too much on my family and everything else. Um, and that's when I started getting recruited uh, six years ago. So that's in a nutshell, is, you know, I didn't want to bore everyone to death here but that's that's kind of the direction I went so in that process two of the schools I worked at I worked at twice in that process my 16 year old Seth went to six elementary schools so that's where the you know you, you know you, as a parent you want to do all the right things and you you know that was hard that's hard as a parent to say is is my son going to six elementary schools the best for him so now since then he's been at this you know he's been at the same school for for a long time in the Westchester school district. So that's been a really, really big positive for him and the other guy when he got caught. So, so and you, you, you touched on something that, you know, my, my goal of this, this interview is to number one, um, highlight your career and, and the things that you've done so that um, get recruited gets the, the attention it needs, but also um, my listeners want to know about the person, right? They want to know about the struggles and the triumphs and the, and the tragedies and all that stuff. That's just human nature is to want to know more about the human side of things. So you mentioned that it was hard on your family. What is, you know, just in, in a, in a 35,000 foot view, what does a week look like as a football coach um, commitment wise, time wise? I think for one, I want to say that if I ever, I, I don't want to coach again, but if I ever did, I'd be smarter about how many hours, sometimes you work to work, you know, try not to do it, but we, they all do it. Um, when I was 
what got me out of it when I was the head coach at Hamilton, I took over a program that wasn't very successful and you know, the culture had to be changed. I'm not here to say anything negative. It's a great school, but I was working a hundred hours a week for sure. I was getting up and answering emails for two hours at 5 AM and then doing work till 11 every day. And it, it definitely took a toll on my family. Um, the other jobs, I mean, I worked a lot, a lot, but not maybe not quite as hard as I had to. When you're the head coach, you know, all the responsibility does fall on you. And we didn't have the staffing or the experience where I can just hand things down to other people. You know, right. but each of your jobs, you work hard, and each of the jobs have different challenges. And each of your jobs as a college coach, not every, every school you work at, is going to be committed to the same level. So I, I have to say that I worked at all great schools, but some of the, we don't need to say which ones, but some of those schools weren't exactly committed to winning in football, yet their expectations were that you had to win. And I think that's, very, that's a very hard business to be in. There's a reason that certain, you know, everyone knows about the Ohio States, the Alabamas, the Penn States. They win every year. Do they have great coaches? Of course they do. But do they have a great foundation? Do they have a great administration that says, we're going to do everything right to be a winning football program? Yes. So they win. There's a reason that certain programs don't win. And, and, and I used to say with some of my buddies, you're either a have or you're a have not. If you're a have, that means they do the right things to help you be successful. If you're a have not, and they're not supporting your, your athletic program, specifically football, it's going to be extremely difficult to win more games than you lose. What was, you know, the kids were when you, so Seth's what, 16, right? So he was 10 or so when you stopped coaching. Yeah. Nine or 10. You know, I know um, as a cop and, and working shift work and, and then being an entrepreneur on top of that and running a gym and having clients and, and everything that I do that um, I'm keenly aware of my relationship with my kids. Like I, I make sure that, you know, my wife, I love her to death. She's the greatest thing in the world, but I know we're going to be good, but we're going to have our highs and lows no matter what, whether I'm working 40 hours a week or 100 hours a week, marriage is just, it's, it's a full-time commitment to, to making sure that your relationship's good. But with my kids, especially when they were growing up, you know, I worked every Christmas forever. I work every Thanksgiving forever. That the understanding that the give and take in that, in my life with them, I can't work Thanksgiving and then the following, you know, Monday or Tuesday when I'm off, shit the bed and not be a good dad on those days. You know, there, there's got to be that, that give and take in the relationship, especially when they're young. How hard was that for you and your kids, A, and B, when you made the final decision to not coach anymore, was there a defining moment that you said, this is it, I'm done? Um, I would say that my kids were young enough and I gave them a lot of attention and I did everything I could on every single free moment I had that I don't think it affected them as much. You know, maybe when I had a loss and I wasn't happy or something like that, that would not be a positive, you know, but I, I, I got to be upfront with you. I think the biggest toll was, was on my wife at the time because, you know, I look back on it now and when I was home, which wasn't a lot. So that was a problem. I wasn't home enough. She had to work a full-time job because I didn't make enough money and she had to do everything for the kids as well. And then when I was home, I really wasn't home. My mind was always thinking about things I had to do, do better. And, and part of that was because I, I took over a few programs that as a defensive coordinator, let's say that weren't successful and it was a lot of work, you know? So I wasn't, I was part of what made me a, a successful defensive coordinator was I was pretty obsessive about, you know, getting all the details done correctly. But part of that would definitely take toll on, on the family that even if we did everything right, we didn't have success, I would be home. And then seeing my kids after a loss or seeing my wife at the time was not going to make me happy. It was, it just wasn't. So, and to add to that, that's where, when I had my last job at Hamilton, I was like, you know, the, the, even the wins became, I wasn't happy enough that we didn't, play as well as we need to play defensively, but we didn't do this right. So even the wins weren't enjoyable and then the losses were miserable. So honestly, I started to get recruited because I think I can make, no, I do make an even bigger impact on kids, making the right choices, educating on them how to make the right choices, developing them into the best players. So I'm doing a lot of the things I did as a coach, but even more personal. Okay. But I don't have the same 
negative attitude. So the last six years, I've definitely been a happier person. I love what I do now. So I, I look back on it and I do have regrets. Of course I do. I mean, I, every day I try to make it up to my kids and hopefully they, they appreciate that, you know, but um, it's a tough profession. And if you are a coach and you work in a situation where you have a good head coach, good administration, the grass always looks greener. Don't, but don't run to the other side because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And uh, there's, all, there's, there's unfortunately only a few schools out there that, are, that have really good jobs for people. Yeah. I, you know, I, could, I can feel when you're talking about the, the, the stress of that, that kind of lifestyle. And um, I never coached. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what you went through, but I also I do know that I've I've had enough conversations with coaches to understand the the amount of pressure that comes with, especially in a in a collegiate environment where you have you know sixty kids or whatever it is on a on a roster that are um, paying a lot of money to go to school there, and in order for the colleges to continue to ask for that kind of money and keep their enrollment up, they have to have uh, incentives for these kids, whether it's athletically or academically. And, and I can only imagine that that pressure from the administration of the school, whether they support you financially or with the, the proper facilities or whatever the case might be or not, that the pressure is the same, no matter what, whether you, they, they give you the support or don't give you the support, the pressure on a coach to win and to do the right thing for these kids has to be enormous. So I can only imagine how that after 22 years, could have a negative um, return on that time investment. It, you know, there's, there's two angles on that. Uh, I think that even if I had no pressure from administration, I know the kind of person I am. I'm, I'm very driven and I'm very hard on myself in whatever I do in life. And I I'm going to say that, you're a little anal retentive too. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, lot of, a lot of us coaches are. <laughs> there's no question. And, you know, so you're hard on yourself. That's great. But I have been in the coaching situations also where you can feel it and you can hear it and you're, you need to win three out of the last four games or, hey, you might never have a job here again. And those are rumblings and you can feel it and you're coming into the office in the morning, your stomach is turning and you feel like you have to do everything to win this game. You have to do everything. I mean, if I can tell a quick story, I, I remember 2009 was my last year at, at Bucknell and, geez, we had a great group of players they you know defensively they were just overachieved they were all little andrew cohen's you know what i mean Be a lot better than i but but i mean is they were just overachievers great kids that bought into our system and we it was my third year as the defensive coordinator there and we were pretty much top three or top four in every category some two some three but one of the better teams and so to backtrack a little bit i remember having a Friday night meeting before our Colgate game. And here I am, I break down and thanking them. I said, you know what? I don't know if everyone ever on campus understands or appreciates or if us coaches tell you enough, but what you guys are doing right now is awesome. And I remember starting to cry and they appreciate that because they knew that I, that I had their back and that I was proud of them. Um, we went out to play Colgate. We lost, but we played, with our hair on fire, we played unbelievable defense against a really good team. And offensively, we changed to what we used to run was an option. And we almost beat a really good team. It was our first week going back to the option. So we were excited. So the next week, we're playing the team, Holy Cross, that's already the league champs, already going to the playoffs, number 18 or number 19 in the country, top five uh, scoring offense, and a kid that ended up signing with the Giants at quarterback. So really, really good team. And so I remember it's, I remember like yesterday, it's Saturday morning and I'm in my kitchen in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And my wife sees me, I'm a little different. I'm looking at my call sheet for the defensive calls. I, I start breaking down. I start crying. And I said, this might be the last time I coach, you know, cause I don't think, you know, I just don't, you know, I'm afraid we're going to lose our jobs, especially if we're going to lose and this is going to be a tough one to win. And, you know, I knew my players believed and I believed we could play great defense, but I, I couldn't tell you we were going to win. They were awfully good. So I just remember that and her supporting me and saying, hey, all you can do is do your best. And if it's over, it's over. What are you going to do? And I thought, hey, if it didn't work out, I'll go somewhere else. So we go out to, for the game and they took off with, I mean, the last like four weeks of the season, we played unbelievable and lights out defense and we, we beat them. We held them to their lowest yard output, their lowest points, everything. 
And I know we were like a four or five win team. We weren't a great team, but I remember my wife at the time coming over to me, hugging me and kissing me on the field. I kind of get, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I just remember, I couldn't believe they did it. You know, we beat them. So, you know, to, to culminate everything I'm saying, it's not the best teams that, that you feel the most satisfaction from. It's, it's the teams where your unit, let's say, got the most out of what they had. Right. So one of those guys I stay in touch with, his name is Greg Jones. He coaches with my brother at, at Wake Forest. I fortunately have helped him. He's gotten the job. So let me be clear. I've helped him. But um, he was a 5'9", 195-pound all-conference middle linebacker playing Division One football because he was smart, because he bought in, because he played hard, because he was tough. He played the last three games with a severely torn labrum. And, you know, like two days after the season, he had to get the surgery. But, you know, guys like that, you, you remember. And you remember those units that just did everything, you know. So I, I love that story. And I, I appreciate you being able to go back, actually physically taking yourself back in your mind to when it happened. And that, that's an intense thing. And um, – not everybody has the ability to do that. So thank you for doing that. Um, when you were talking about uh, your 5'9", 195-pound middle linebacker, you know, I, at Max Out, we get a lot of good athletes. We get a lot of um, teams that are coming in. But very rarely do we get the kid that is hungry enough and has zero athletic ability that simply just wants to be the very best he can possibly be. How, how much can I push myself? So I, had this, I tell this story a lot. We had this freshman come in. Name was Zach. He was 5'7", 165 pounds of, of no muscular shape whatsoever. Red hair, glasses, freckles. And dad comes in with him and says, um, my boy needs to get stronger. I said, okay. So I pull him aside. I said, why do you, why do you want to get stronger? And he says, because um, I got cut from the ninth grade team. And in, in our school district, you have varsity, JV, and then the ninth grade team. So there's not another level you can play at there isn't another team you can try to get on so he got cut and couldn't play football that year I said okay and he goes I don't ever want to get cut from anything ever again I said fair enough I can work with that and that five seven 160 pound non-muscular shaped red-haired glasses freckled kid ended up starting his junior and senior year at nose tackle and he squatted he ended up, by the time he graduated high school, he was squatting almost 500 pounds, bench pressing 350. Um, still not very athletic. Didn't really have a whole lot going for him, but he was um, point of attack strong as hell. And they would put him in on goal line when he was, so his, his sophomore year, he made JV and played special teams. His junior year, he started off um, on JV and went to varsity and then started the last couple of games. And his senior year, he he started on the defensive line. And he was just one of those kids that I could see his hunger. And he's now, he went on, went to Penn State and played rugby there and um, he's graduated as an adult now. But it's those kinds of stories that, as far as on my level, and I can tell from your level, those are the ones that mean the most to you. When you're saying it's not the championships necessarily, it's the, it's the kids that outperformed what God gave them based on their, you know, their heart, their grit, their, their resiliency, and the fact that they believed in something bigger than themselves. Yeah, I, I love thinking about and talking about the my former players. I don't want to say my players, but the players that that played under me, and remembering the stories and and the different the different types of stories. You know, the kids that overcame everything, or the kids that were really talented but also worked really hard. Those were the special ones, but those special kids stand out for different reasons, and I have different players from different schools and you know you don't have your favorite I, I don't want to say I had my favorites in terms of how I treated them but I'd say it, you'd be you wouldn't be human if you didn't have your your guys that you consider your favorites your guys that you knew no matter what you you can go to battle with them and those are the guys you wanted to stay with no matter what I tell and I don't know if you've ever heard this but I, I tell people you, everybody in your lifetime you get probably five people that you can trust with digging a hole and not asking why and maybe carrying a blue tarp filled with whatever inside of it and burying it. I have five people in my life that I know that I can count on at any given time. And I think as a coach, you have, you probably have a 
you could probably list five guys that, that if you formed any team that you knew that those five guys were going to be the hardest working, the most dedicated, loyal, um, hungry guys that you could always count on. And I think as a, I, mean, I was never a good athlete and I was never a really good teammate because I, I don't get coached well. I don't like people telling me what to do. I'm kind of hard headed, which you probably know. And, uh, I'm not ashamed of that. I, I'm, I'm proud of my lone wolfness sometimes. Um, but as a coach, I mean, I can tell you five kids that I've strength, done strength coaching for that I could put up against anybody. And they would, you know, if, if I told them to go attack, they would attack until I told them to stop. And th that's guys and girls. Do you have five, and I don't know whether you want to name them or not, but do you have five guys that you would go to war with as a coach if you were making a team? I think five would be hard, but I'd like to tell one story about yeah, one of them. Please. Um, I mean, I could tell you each in every school, the guys that stood out, but um, I've never been real good at staying in touch with guys because you're moving a lot and being overwhelmed with my job or my family at the time. But, um, and I think he knows this cause I tell him this, but and he knows I'm no BS, but I have a guy that played for me at Stony Brook the second time I was there that might be the toughest human being with the best work ethic and leadership skills that I've ever been around. His name is Aiden Smith. Um, I still talk to him. He's shown up at one of my showcases to coach, but, uh, and just, uh, I think it was last week or the week before he just won the long Island championship as a coach. You know, he's a great, great young man, but l let me just say that I'll, I'll say that I went to Stony Brook and we weren't very good as a team nor defense. My first year there, we play a game. We beat this team, St. Francis, pretty well. I tried to play everyone, and we're having a meeting. And, we're, and understand that we're transferring from Division Three to Division Two, to now 1AA, but most of our players are D3 or maybe D2 type guys. And it's still a little bit more about, you know, why don't I play more and everyone, you know, but I'm trying to win and, and there's accountability on me to, to help our team be more successful. So I could tell something was up. So I called the defensive meeting. Um, Aiden was a sophomore. He was in that meeting. And Aiden was not a starter at the time. Aiden was a 5'7", 200, maybe 5'8". I don't know. 5'7". Come on, Aiden. You know you're not told that. But um, about 215, he is put together strong and a just iron hard body. And I go up talking. And then I, you know, I learned as a coach at a younger age that – at times you need to let the, as long as they're respectful, you need to let them talk. And there was a lot of negativity, whether it was about me, the way we're doing things, yada, yada. So I remember this, Aiden was not a starter, but I knew from the first time I met him though, that he, he was a kid you had to calm down and practice. Legitimately, people say that this is legit. Before I got there, they say they had to kick him off the field. And, but that's the kind of the kid you want, right? So Aiden stands up in front of the whole team and he's respected and he's one of the guys, but Aiden's going to do and say the right things. So Aiden got up and said, guys, everyone in this room knows I want to play as much as anybody here. And he had my back. And he said, Coach Cohen wants to win. He wants to play the right guys. He wants to do the right thing. He cares about you. But he does want to win. He's got to do what he thinks is right. And you got to buy into that, basically. He's a sophomore in front of the entire defense. And I knew he was a great kid, but at that point, Oh God, you know what I mean? And so I didn't just start him. Someone else got hurt and he started and ended up being an all conference player. Uh, but we don't have to talk much. It doesn't matter if anything ever happened to my family or his family, we know we'd be there for each other. Um, but I just, I can't tell you how much I respect even academically. He was a, you know, a, a hard worker. I wouldn't say he was Einstein. He wasn't dumb by any means, but he was a good student because he competed in the classroom. He competed as a player, and now he's competing. He's a teacher, um, and he's the head football coach. I think it's uh, I think it's Shoreham Wading River in Long Island, and they won the Long Island Championship. So kids like that, though, are just – and he's not a kid. I mean, he's a probably 35, 36-year-old grown man. But, I mean, I, he'll have your back no matter what, and you're going you're gonna to win a lot. And then the end of the story is – so he, he, his senior year, we were very good. We were now 1AA. Uh, we were eight and two. We were third in the country in defense. And he was a very good player. Were there better players than him? Probably, but he was very good. But the way he held 
all their 10 members of that defense accountable for everything they did was unbelievable. During the summer, he's yanking people out of bed in the morning. He's making them work out. So we have almost everyone back the next year. He's gone. And then we had three very, very good players get hurt. So that didn't help. But we missed him and his leadership, his toughness, because people were afraid to let him down because they knew if they let him down, he's going to smack him in the head. Mm -hmm. And we were not as, we were just not the same unit. And it was, it was his leadership, his toughness. And I saw that. I don't know if I've maybe close, but I don't know if I've ever seen a player that, that just was the driving force behind our success. That's Aiden Smith. Uh, wow. Great kid. Young man. Sorry. Well, shout out to Aiden Smith. Um, man. So y- you quit coaching. You, you decide that you need to, to transition. When did, when did get recruited become an idea? When did that, that pop in your head on, on that? Cause I mean, in business as an entrepreneur, you're, it's great to do the thing that you love, but you got to find out whether or not anybody gives, gives a crap or wants it. Right. So when did you decide that get recruited was going to be a thing? So in 2009, I was at Bucknell after that Holy Cross win and I was the acting head coach, didn't get the job. And I started thinking about doing something like get recruited. And I started thinking that I always had a passion for recruiting. I had a passion for learning about schools. I had great contacts back then even because whether it was from my brother or just coaching at you know numerous schools. But I, I saw that to be honest with you, a lot of the college coaches weren't exactly upfront with families or families weren't educated or their high school coaches just didn't know, A, what does it take to get into a school or B, how, how good do you really have to be to play at each of the levels? Just a lot of, I'm sorry to say, a lot of ignorance about the entire recruiting process. So that's 2009. And I started writing a lot of stuff down and thinking, you know, with all my recruiting success and all my contacts, I could really help guys. I was, I'm the fly in the room that always listened to what the coaches are looking for, knew academically what everyone needed. So this was a really good fit. So I really thought about it when I was unemployed, but I wasn't ready to give up football. So then I, I went from there and I went to Lycoming to Bowdoin to Hamilton. When Hamilton's, when that, ran out, I was like, this is what I'm doing. So my father-in-law, rest his soul, was very, very supportive of me doing this business. He was a small business owner as well. Great guy, was really supportive. And I went in the basement and just started. I started first reaching out to high schools, peewee, youth coaches, using all my, my, my resources of my contacts of college coaches to give me information on players. And, and I just started it from scratch. And and now it's six years and every, 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 even now, every month, just adding a, another resource to help our clients, adding another resource to, to help the business be successful. You know, like I do these, these, I just had on Sunday a showcase, which, you know, it's great. We get 50 plus colleges there. You know, we had about 85 players, but for our clients and everyone else there to be in front of all those colleges, it gives them unbelievable opportunities, which that's, that's why I'm doing it, to, to help them, to be seen. And a lot of these kids, if they're not in front of them at these showcases, they might never get a chance to showcase their abilities in front of the coaches. So hopefully I got, didn't get off the subject too much. No, no. I'd, so, you know, I've, I've been blessed to, to, to know you and, and see the, the growth of Get Recruited and, and even be a part of it for a little while as, as, a, as someone who was making some calls for you. Um, talk about, you know, the, the recruiting process. What is – what is the, um, the thing that Get Recruited does the best to help um, families? Because, you know, I, you and I have had many in-depth talks about this, and um, a lot of parents think their kid is the next Tim Tebow when he may just be a, a, a Division three football player. And, and going, you know, I think one of the greatest things you do is your evaluation of players based on, on their huddle film, based on one-on-one in-person stuff that you do that – Let's let's go through what what is, what is the process of what Get Recruited does and what what separates you from from anyone else doing this type of work. Sure. So f- for one, you hit it on the head with the the evaluations. I'm. I used to tell when I used to coach, I used to tell other coaches I worked with that it's not only about getting the players you want, it's wanting the right players. So and there's a lot to that besides just a film, but initially my evaluation on a player that's given to me 
is is upon the film and then I start asking questions. So the first question I ask every kid and I'll, I'll get, I'm sorry, I'll move on. But the first question I ask, do you like or love football? Every single player I ever recruited and every client, I asked them that in my first meeting. Um, to be very honest, if you don't love it, then it's not for you because it is, it's about rewards. It's about relationships, college football, but it is about a lot of work and there is a lot of ups and downs. If you don't absolutely love it, it's probably not for you. So to start, I think we are extremely honest and we evaluate. I would say brutally sometimes. Brutally sometimes. And sometimes that turns people off. But if you're not honest from the start, you know, we don't make promises. People who do what we do, you know, that are, you know, we have a hundred percent placement rate into college, not a hundred percent scholarships, a hundred percent placement rate. We will not take on a player that we don't think can play at the college level or have some something that stands out to that's going to get them recruited. You know, if you have a 6'4", 300 pound kid and he's not great, but he is 6'4", 300 and he has grades, he's going to get recruited and we're going to have the contacts to be able to get him in touch with the right people. So it's got to start with something that I think we are, I, we evaluate a lot of players. I watch more film now than when I coached. We have eight guys on staff. Only one of them is not a former college coach. That's Rocco Casulo, but he's, he coached at St. Thomas Aquinas. He won two national championships, arguably the best high school program in the country. Right. And they're from Florida. So um, even though they evaluate him, I still, I do the evaluation as well. And when I get a kid and I'm like, ah, what do you think? I give him to the other guys to watch. We share it, but we're honest. Okay. So if we evaluate a player and say he's a division two player, we'll say right now, we think you're a division two player. If you want to play at a higher level, can you perhaps, but you have to do a B, C, and D. And there aren't a lot of kids out there that are willing to do that. So I think what we do well is, one, give a fair evaluation and an accurate evaluation. There's very few kids I've ever been wrong with, okay? Um, From there, we work on the development of the young student-athlete. And some parents don't always value that, but I think that's as important as anything. When someone's a client with us, they're on the phone with us once a week, and they have the ability to call, email, or text us anytime. During those talks, we're going over lifting, running, stretching, academics, everything imaginable, diet, and we're just holding them accountable to become the best product. We always tell them, you have to first be developed into the best recruit possible, and then we're going to do a better job, okay? Um, And then from there, I think, you know, we're going to email the schools, and we're going to put them on social media, and that's good. And a lot of people open our emails because they know we're not giving them a player unless we truly believe they can play there. But from there, it's reaching out personally and calling the colleges and getting direct answers. And there's guys even that are friends of mine, good friends of mine that it might take me two weeks sometimes. Those guys are working, like I said earlier, 100 hours a week. Right. But it seems like when the player they're really excited about, they typically get back to you. You know, but um, so I think that's the really the process from start to finish of what I think separates us. I think what separates us is the personal relationships we have with the families, the players, and then the, obviously the college coaches. And we know what it takes developmentally, things that you need to do. You know, for instance, really quick, flexibility is something that most kids don't do enough. And they are like, why is that important? Flexibility is the ability for a player to play with leverage. It's your ability to transfer your weight. It's your ability to just be overall athletic and change directions well. Kids that are tight in the hips, that are stiff, I would say. That's what college coaches, their term. Um, even if they're 6'4 and they're 280, if they're tight in the hips, that's going to limit the schools that recruit them. So big kids, any big kid that's listening to this, if you're big and you can bend with your knees, not your waist, and if you have fast feet, you will be recruited. They can get you stronger, but fast feet and loose hips, that's more difficult. All right. So start working on that now. So there's a lot of people that, that subscribe to the, uh, the online recruiting stuff. So the NSCA and, or whatever they're, you know, the, the, the different recruiting, be, rec- uh, be recruiters, that one of them, yeah. whatever. So while I, I understand the value that, that coaches may be going there to look at tape, what is the, um, cause obviously cost becomes uh, a prohibited factor in some people's decision-making. What is the, if you could state it in one or two things, what are the one or two things that you do that 
makes the value of what you provide worth the investment? I think for one that we actually are coaches. I'm a coach. I'm still a football coach. So I think our knowledge and our ability to communicate that with our clients is an unbelievable resource. Um, other, I'm not going to say any names, but no other company is directly calling the college coaches and knows a lot of these college coaches and can get direct answers. Um, and then the ability where we're on the phone with our clients and they can call us, text us or email us when they want. That's unique, but it's something that when I started the business, I said, we're never going to have as many clients as I don't want to have too many clients. I don't, not one of our guys on staff has more than 40 clients. No, actually no one has close to that, to be honest. But I tell you that because they can develop a rapport. They can make the calls they need. They can do what they need to do with the clients. The other companies are dealing with, I, I know companies sometimes have, uh, they can have over a thousand for one person. You know, so I think that individual attention, the individual knowledge and contacts. So one last thing, like if, if Matt, if Matt's a student athlete and he's interested in um, Missouri State, so we have eight guys now, we have a guy in Missouri. So I might not know anyone at Missouri, but if H.T. Kenny knows someone in Missouri, he'll call. So all of us work together and use all of our resources of contacts to help out all of our players. You know, if he's in the Northeast, that's not going to be that hard for me, to be honest with you, um, especially with all the conferences I worked at. But I might not know someone. You know, we have three guys in Florida. You know, we have a guy in Pittsburgh. We have a guy in Texas. So it allows us to increase the amount of contacts we have. So you're pretty much a national organization within, within a hand grenade. We are. If anyone who is interested in what we do and has college coaching experience, we could really use someone in the West Coast. Um, I think those kids need it. You know, those kids are far away from all these great academic schools here and they need that connection. We just need someone with their, their feet in the ground in California. And there's some really good football and academics in California. Outside of the physical traits and the football knowledge, what, what would you, um, if you were, had a message for a student athlete, a high school student athlete, what would be the one thing you would tell them to um, be aware of or, um, you know, what, what's the one tip that you have for them to help increase their ability to be recruited? So from a, from a, a pure athletic or academic or both? Just Can in, I give one even, of each? What, sure. Okay. So academically, they have to. There's a lot more money out there for academics than there is for football. Everyone talks about football scholarships. They're tough to get. But there is a lot of academic money out there. And also, if, you're, if someone can get into a school that they would otherwise not get in without the help of football. That's, that's like a scholarship in my opinion. So, so from an academic standpoint, working hard, putting in the time and then preparing for the SAT or ACTs is huge. That's the academic part. From an athletic standpoint, one of the biggest things I think is a concern now is social media is great, but everyone is listening to or reading the kid down the street who gets offered or he's four stars and he's this or that, and I'm better than him. Why am I not getting recruited? I think the big thing is worry about your destination and do everything that you can to be the best, most polished student athlete you can. You can't do anything about the other kids and you shouldn't worry about the other kids. You should worry about you becoming the best product possible. I say product because that's jar, you know, like that's our job is to help develop you. And then from there, showcase your talents in front of the schools. But if you're consumed, some kids get consumed and want to be recruited more than they want to work hard to become the best product. And I think that's a problem. And it's not only a problem for the student athlete, it's a problem for parents. Parents are scoping around, looking at the sites and, hey, this kid got offered by this school and Johnny's a better player than that kid. Well, that's fine. But the only thing you can do about it is show the other coaches that you are the better player. All right. Now, one last thing, and, and we've talked about this, is social media as far as what kids are putting out there on social media and how that impacts um, not only your decision to take them on as a client, but also a school's decision to bring them on um, with, with any type of scholarship or, or allow them on their team. You want to talk about that a little bit? Tell, I hope I'm going in the right direction here. The, the social media thing is something that I address with all my clients, but even when I go to showcases, I think your social media in football, it's, it's Twitter. I say Facebook's more like the old man's page with like mm -hmm. me and, and Matt over here. Um, Instagram is for some other sports, but Twitter is for football. That's where college coaches are on. That's where the players are. Um, 
that should be your business page. Business page means that is for football and football only. You never know. You, you follow someone, and the next thing you know, they're posting something that's inappropriate, and the college gets a picture of that, and there's beers in it or anything inappropriate. Avoid that. So I tell all my clients that you're only following football coaches, and you're only you know you're gonna we post our clients' information every seven to fourteen days, and it and it does some good. You know, it definitely does. Um, but we tell them, don't be posting anything but football. Can it be useful? Yeah. Then the next question from there will be, well, he's gotten an offer. Does that mean everyone else is going to offer? And I bring that up because it's networking. That's what you do on social media. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get another offer, but it does mean you're most likely going to get viewed by more people, which is going to give you a better chance to get more offers. All right. So it's networking. Awesome. Well, Brother, is there any one, if you had one closing um, point or, or tip or advice that you would put out there for parents or student athletes, what would it be before we end the show? I think, you know, from the, from the standpoint of the overall recruiting process, if you're going to get on something for your, on your kids about, number one, academically make sure they're achieving and they're doing everything to be the best students they can. Okay. From there, the next thing is from a football standpoint, make sure that you have a a real and a strong evaluation by a professional so you can set up a real game plan. These camp things that are taking place right now, my types of camps where there's 50 colleges at one site, those are great. But those other ones where there's one college there, you better make sure that you've had contact with them and there's real, real personal interest or else you're going to go there and waste your time, your money, and your efforts. So put together a clear game plan of schools a you can get into academically b you can afford c you can play at those are the more and there's other things obviously but like you know distance from home big school small school but make sure you're not wasting your time looking at the right places have a professional evaluate it that's what we do we evaluate it tell you what level you can play and then we help you put a game plan together okay if it's okay i'm just going to say our you know what Absolutely. our twitter is yep. our twitter is get with a capital g underscore underscore Recruited with a capital R. Our website is getrecruitedconsulting.com. Okay, all of our information is there. You can email me off it. You can call me anytime. But I really appreciate having an opportunity to talk to everyone. Um, I'm going to give you my cell because I'm not embarrassed about that. 570-428-2872. This is what I do for my career. That's all I do. Um, so if anyone ever has just questions, I'm, I answer the phone all day and answer recruiting questions. I'm happy to, in the big picture, um, I want to be able to help student athletes have great opportunities. That's our most important thing at Get Recruiting. We want to be honest and do whatever we can to help. Awesome. I'll put uh, on the social media, I'll put all the links to your social media stuff, awesome. the website and all that stuff as well. So um, thank you everybody for once again, tuning into this episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kubler. Thank you again to uh, my good buddy, uh, the founder of Get Recruited Consulting, Andrew Cohen. And uh, you know, go out and be kind to one another. God bless.